I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. My guest today is Nathan Dean, a writer, trainee counselor, practicing witch, artist, and activist. You can find his discussions through his platform, Olave Counseling, named after ancient Irish bard poet advisors. You can follow him at Twitter at O-L-L-A-M-H-C and check out his writing at Medium, olavecounseling.medium.com. That's O-L-L-A-M-H, counseling with two L's, dot medium, dot com. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry. Available from Chapar Books, 2019. For more, you can visit our publisher's website, trapar.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. You can follow me at Twitter and Instagram at rawsin underscore. That's R-A-W-S-I-N underscore at Twitter and Instagram. And now you can find me at TikTok at Dr. Vanessa Sinclair 23 at TikTok. For more, check out the podcast's main website, renderingunconscious.org, or my website, drvanessasinclair.let, for links and more information. You can support the podcast at our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Vanessa23Carl. That's V-A-N-E-S-S-A 2-3-C-A-R-L. Thank you so much to all our Rendering Unconscious podcast patrons and listeners. Your support is greatly appreciated. It seemed like the perfect term, Olive, for this sort of intersection between therapy and counseling and magic and all of these different elements. Uh, But as an Englishman that doesn't speak Irish, (laughs) it was probably a really bad choice Um, because I still say Olam like all the time. Um, But yeah, it's Olave. Okay. Like if you have an H after an M, you pronounce it as a V. And the H also indicates that the A is a long sound. So, and it apparently stems from, there's there's another podcast called the Blind Boy Podcast. And he's interviewed people about Irish Gaelic and all of this thing, all of this kind of stuff, um, about why Irish is written the way it is. uh, Partly uh, so that (laughs) when the English turned up and tried to pronounce place names, uh, they always got it wrong. So they could always spot a spy because they would be like, are you an Olam? And it's like, that guy's English. <laughs> like, that guy doesn't know how to pronounce these words. Um, but it also comes from not being able to put like diacritical marks on letters when they got typewriters and things like that. So it's all really interesting, but uh, I just keep saying it wrong, um, which I think is just the most English thing that I can do is steal an Irish word and pronounce it wrong everywhere I go. Um, so yes, Olave is, I think, how you pronounce it. But at least you acknowledge that. I I try. Like I I realized that as someone that grew up in a very isolated rural area and then went to a relatively small city for my like university studies that when I came back home to recover from surgery like during COVID and all I had was Twitter and yelling at Boris Johnson online (laughs) that my understanding of politics was just not up to scratch and it still isn't like there's still so much more that I need to learn um 
And as one of the rants that I may get into with this, I think that therapy and counseling as a whole has a bit of an issue with not really catching up with what is happening politically, culturally, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because we're still in this sort of state of trying to be counselors as, as we were like one-on-one, -on -one, you know, helping people like self-actualize what they want to accomplish and all of this stuff. But we can't really do that if we've got, you know, a single mum with two kids who's trying to feed them when they've got outstanding debts to a landlord who has bought up every property in the surrounding area. And we're treating that like we can just give them like cognitive behavioral leaflets and go, you know, write a diary of your feelings and then your rent troubles will go away. Um, and that's just not how it works. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, I think there's just this, I, it, I think it's important, especially as a white, cisgendered, heterosexual dude, that I try and become aware of these things, partly because of just the landscape that, that these clients are going to be in but also because it's just really interesting. And there's, what's the point in narrowing what I can learn if there's all of this really cool stuff out there? Yeah, no, I, I learned that too when I worked in a hospital setting with patients who had HIV and, you know, I'm supposed to be doing counseling with them. And meanwhile, like they can't get stable housing and they have all of these like real life tangible issues. So I ended up just doing a lot of case management, like making phone calls and being like, I'm this, I'm this person psychologist. We need to get them housing. Like that's what their mental health requires. Yeah, exactly. And like um, my girlfriend showed me a show on Amazon of all places uh, called New Amsterdam, um, which is probably the most socialisty TV show I've seen. And it's still pretty liberal in terms of its like ideologies and politics and what it can say. But there's an episode where, spoilers, there's a guy that who is homeless and is costing this hospital in America millions because he just keeps turning up with a new problem and this guy's like if we literally just give this guy a house like <laughs> this <laughs> sold if you're if the hospital's problem is funding because we're privatized then giving this guy a house is cheaper than us constantly trying to fix him um and this is one of the things that just generally just gets like really pisses me off is that even the capitalism of England is done atrociously. Like I am nowhere near any of those kind of ideologies. I think it's just, there's just no point in them. They're just very outdated and lazy. But if you're gonna do it, then do it properly. And there's a lot of people that in power who are trying to run the country under these ideologies and just messing it up even in their own framework. If the whole point is to capitalize on your workforce, if they're all miserable and they have nowhere to live, then you haven't got a workforce. Like, what, I don't understand how we can be in this state and people still be supporting them within therapeutic, psychotherapeutic, et cetera, et cetera, like professions. It, it just baffles me how we're still there. So how did you come up with the idea for your counseling? Um, so I was a substitute teacher um, f a few years ago and began to really see how the education system is a mess here. To be honest, I'm going to say that a lot about pretty much everything <laughs> in England. Like, I don't think people, when I talk, like, oh, I think we should abolish this. I think we should abolish, I want to pretty much abolish everything. So, um, yeah, being a teacher on the other side, like trying to like help students learn anything in a system that was, you know, we still use a school bell, which was because the first schools were in workhouses and it was the bell that indicated the end of a shift for the orphan children. And we still use that system now, which just, again, it's another thing that just baffles me. Um, but I'd be moved into helping like special needs kids or uh, whatever institution was calling it whatever on that day and was specifically helping this one kid who 
needed a lot more help than just me trying to do maths with him uh, one on one. And at the same time, I wasn't really looking after myself. And the kid got moved on to a different institution, like moved into a different school, and I just completely crashed. And at the same time, I was studying with uh, one college to do counselling. And at this point, I then went into hospital with my like, Crohn's disease. I like stopped working, had to stop studying, all this stuff. And I just had this sort of realization of what I was, I was trying to plow through in an unhealthy way. And I wasn't taking time for my own mental health. I wasn't taking time for uh, the people around that I cared about. Went back, when, whilst I was recovering at the end of that little bit of recovery, this is now during COVID, went to Ridgeway College in Lincoln to finish my studies. And it's just this, what I like about it is that I can do all of the things I wanted to do with the teaching, which that system was stopping me from doing in a way that I felt like I had a bit more self-control over what I was doing because I see that the what what I was trying to do as a substitute teacher was essentially guide people to what would help them self-actualize get the knowledge they needed to get out of whatever systems they were in blah 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 but I couldn't do that because the education structure isn't designed for that. It's designed to make sure that kids can sit behind a desk all day uh, in an office uh, or whatever. Um, whereas I feel like with counseling, I have a little bit more freedom in terms of what I can teach, what I can guide towards. And although counseling isn't about giving advice, it's about, when it comes to teaching, I don't really like this pedagogical approach of there's a guy at the front of the class and he says, here's some maths questions, this is how it works, do what I say, you'll get a grade if you do it well. Uh, I much prefer, what do you want to learn? How can we help you learn that? Which essentially is counselling in all but words. Um, so kind of stumbled into it as I do everything. <laughs> like I That's don't really know way. how I end up doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Um, no, absolutely, because the, it is sort of like being a kind of guide. And I feel like also the more that you, like you said, you weren't taking care of yourself, you're just trying to push through. And I feel like the more that we learn to take care of ourselves and like are more authentic and more self-actualized. And like, you know, like I had a big kind of stressor when I started being more public like with the art that I make and the music that I make. I was like, can I really put this on the same website as my psychoanalytic work? You know, like, am I allowed to do that? And then I was like, why not? You know? And then I've had people come to me like, oh yeah, when I saw your website, and you know, had this and this on it. I was like, oh, this person just stopped giving a fuck at some point. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, basically, like at some point you just have to like live your life, you know? <laughs> yeah, but yeah, like um, it's one of these things like, cause I, I'm essentially the other way around. Like if, if you went into psychoanalysis as like the profession, then you, brought in the art of like oh, I also do this I feel like I did it sort of the other way around because I started in theater I did media production at university I was going to be a screenwriter like that was the trajectory and over time that evolved into teaching and then that evolved into therapy but at the same token I don't really see a lot of distinctions between these things and I find that the how we demarcate what people do or what they are is once again a very western white eurocentric academic other buzzwords that men like me say at parties to sound interesting uh thing <laughs> which uh isn't the full picture of how these things should work I don't I look at tarot cards and then in terms of like a magical practice and then look at say uh 
a motive does to have like sad and then it's got a blue background or another one that says like anger and it's got a red background or telling someone to draw a shape about how they feel they're the same thing it's just that we stripped out all of the spiritual lingo and made it more palatable <laughs> and the aesthetic all of that that is what makes it interesting and, and beneficial and we just simplified it to such a point that we're like are you angry at things maybe you shouldn't be and that's not, that, doesn't, that doesn't help anyone <laughs> um um yeah so it i find it difficult to say what i am it's like when you go to a networking event and someone comes up to you and says like what do you do like I don't really know what I do I know what kind of what I am but what I do depends on who I'm talking to and what answer they would prefer like the poet at whatever stand-up open like spoken word event is gonna want is gonna find a more interesting answer in me saying I'm an artist or a theater director versus Mrs. So-and-so from the council who's just invested in five businesses who wants me to say that I'm a therapeutic entrepreneur or whatever. But all of these words don't really mean a lot to me. I just do things which I hope helps people or me. <laughs> and yeah, so I struggle with those kind of demarcations. Like, oh, you are a therapist and that means that you have to do things in this clear cut manner. Oh, you are an artist and that means that you have no money and you smoke a lot oh, you are a whatever, and you do this. And all of it kind of a, a becomes an amalgam thing eventually. But how you describe that to other people, there I struggle. Well, it is such a narrow-minded point of view to kind of make all of these demarcations because, like, I was even thinking of, even in medicine, like, uh, not really treating the whole person it's like my, my father was in the hospital a couple of years ago and it was like there's a lung doctor and a kidney doctor and a stomach doctor and a heart doctor and it's like none of them really they, they all wanted to do to him what was best for their organ but like yeah. some of what they one would do would like mess up the other organ <laughs> it was like who's here to like look at what's best for him as a whole person you know <laughs> Uh, yeah, my my um, a friend of mine who is working in medicine, who has done like some exceptional jobs in like the NHS and psychiatry and various other things. We were having that exact discussion recently, which is why are we not treating the body as a holistic entity? Uh, there's a lot of research in how the gastric system affects mental health. There's a direct relationship between your gut biome and what's going on in your head. I know my friend's just going to be going insane with how incorrectly I am describing this because I'm not a doctor. Um, but as, as someone with Crohn's who, whenever I had a flare up, I would get more than irritable, angry, impulsive, sad, depressed, whatever words you want to use. Like it was very apparent that my Crohn's, which affects my gut, my gastric system, et cetera, is directly changing how I think, how I feel. But if I went to a gastroenterologist, they're not necessarily going to have a psychiatric background in the same way that a psychiatrist is not going to have a, a gastric background, which is no one's fault. But if the way that we're going to organize things is with this very Western understanding of organizing things, then that's what's gonna come out. That's what's gonna happen. Um, I wish that we could just overhaul the entire NHS to you know, align with those kind of ideas, but even discussing the notion of that, people just immediately presume that you wanna privatize it, sell it off to the conservatives or anything else. Um, because again, that demarcating of what things are there are layers and fractals of that that just keep moving further out and out and out and out. And we can stop that demarcation, say, between, oh, there's a relationship between the bowel and the mind, cool. But that is a drop in the ocean in comparison to everything else that we have organized into these neat little boxes, which are very beneficial for capitalists, but not very beneficial for 
growth, self-actualization, community actualization, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, or anything to do with society or the planet. And you're right, we do need, I mean, you said like you want to abolish a lot of these systems, but we really do need structural change on like a grand scale level, you know? Right deep, yeah, right deep down to the core of what these things are. Like we, to go again to this sort of boundary between politics and magic again, if we recently had COP20 or whatever it was called, where loads of people took their private jets to London to talk about the environment. Oh um, uh, uh, David Attenborough's there talking about how we all have to care about orangutans or whatever. And it's all like, oh, if only the royal family would donate more money to these things, then we wouldn't have you know, all of this CO2 crisis, I'm going to go back on my private jet now, back to my manor house. Um, the moment that you introduce an idea like, well, the people of Turtle Island, um, as it was called, just believe that, and I'm going to hyper simplify to the point where it's probably a little offensive, but the trees, the rocks, the mountains have a spirit that you must care for. Oh no, that's a silly idea. That's ridiculous. That trees don't have feelings. Go away. We believe in science here. But the scientists are taking private, well not the scientists themselves, but the people who are purporting that science is the answer are taking private jets to discuss environmentalism. And the people that apparently have this ridiculous notion of spirituality are the ones which they have not been to blame or are culpable in global warming and global climate catastrophe at all because they respected the environment that they were in. So if over here in the West, we did this thing of rationality is good and like science and irrationality is bad and is like believing in things. And the moment that we created that initial split, that's where I think we went wrong. That enlightenment, everything must be science, everything must be rational that's where I think we miss the point hugely in terms of like what knowledge is beneficial and what even is knowledge um yeah something like that yeah, it's a really good point <laughs> and like you, like you also pointed out the people who are so supposed to be rational are taking jets to you know to a conference and talk about carbon emissions like that's not rational <laughs> You know, and if we did recognize that the earth is alive, then maybe we would treat it better instead of just looking at it as something to be mined for resources. Exactly. And even if we frame it as rational, like, oh, but I need my private jet to get to the conversation. If I don't, then I can't be there and then we can't make things good. Even if you do rationalize it, the fact that we have presumed that everything rational is a good thing to do and everything irrational is bad. Like, sometimes you can rationalize an answer to a problem and make it worse, when sometimes it might just be, oh, actually, if we all just did this very irrational thing, everything would get better. Um, the book I'm working on at the moment, the next like big novel I'm writing, is set in a world where all conspiracies are true the earth is flat, it is hollow, there are lizard people, chemtrails are true. Um, not, and what I'm hoping I can address with it is what is more important, whether something is real and true or not, or whether something is beneficial or not. And so with the lizard people that live in the earth, that is a conspiracy mostly pushed by David Icke. It's an anti-Semitic uh, conspiracy theory that it all ties into the George Soros's of the world of controlling everything with the Illuminati, blah, blah, blah. That's awful. Like why, it's, it's, it's just an excuse where they're using a mythology as an excuse to just spread terrible things. But in the context of a book where these people are real, if there was an entire other sapient 
race? Why are there no conspiracy theorists which are doing xenobiology? Why is no one researching how vestigial tails could help with cancer treatments? Why, why does the conspiracy always have to be, look at all these lizards that are in the world? We know why, it's, an, it's, it's a panic response to a world that is impossible to grasp rationally. Um, but in terms of what's more important, something that's true or something that's beneficial, where is that line? And I think you can only really figure that out through discerning for yourself and having just the wherewithal to figure that out. There's a book called The Denizen's Handbook by Jim Sim. And he talks about discernment as like the, the important crux in terms of spirituality and knowledge and other artistic endeavors, because it's how we, it's our relationship with the knowledge, which is important, not necessarily the knowledge itself. Um, I hope that made sense because it's, there's a fine line between supporting a conspiracy theory in a negative way and then doing like a parody around it. And I'm hoping I'm walking that line in the book, but I won't know until I've finished it. Yeah, that does make a lot of sense. Um, and it, I mean, it reminds me like in the field of psychoanalysis, it's like there's the knowledge that you learn for yourself and about yourself, and your kind of your truth that you can learn through the practice of psychoanalysis. But then people have also used the psychoanalysis as like a way to gatekeep and like make these institutes that like keep it away, the, this information away from other people or to use it as like, a master kind of discourse where it's like you have to learn this and not learn to think for yourself but just memorize and repeat what these master theorists have said yes and i think uh that's going back again to this sort of academic academia and science is rational and good so we've put freud in the clever genius rational box ergo everything he said is amazing whereas young depending on who you talk to will move him into the he wrote a big red book about all of his dreams wasn't he a weirdo box and <laughs> we won't and we'll only we'll pick and choose what fits the rationality framework and what doesn't um and that's just again i feel like it's missing the point if you have a client who's saying that they have regular dreams of being a king, say, why use a rational response to that and go, well, what this is, is your brain processing the events of the day, blah, blah, blah. Why are we not using, would an, in the case of this imaginary client, would a more irrational response be beneficial? Is there a way of teaching them a relationship between an irrational inner world that we will treat as real as much as a one that is out? Um, but that's the, that's me having read R.D. Lang recently, and that's just the divided self coming through in me. Um, I haven't read enough of his stuff yet to really have a, a grasp, but he, the fact that at the age of 28, in the late 50s, he was writing a book which essentially wanted to do away with psychiatric language, but didn't know how to because he was trying to write a psychiatric text using words like dementia praecox and schizophrenia to stuffy old psychiatrists and he was trying to explain to them like oh maybe they're not mad maybe they just need to be loved and cared for uh and he's using the lang their language to try and teach that that's that's just insane what he was trying to accomplish like i can't even get my head around that like at 28, I was just smoking and drinking a lot. I wasn't like, and he was trying to dismantle our understanding of psychiatry. Um, I, I think with limited success, but, but again, I think that's just because of the limits of his language. Um, but that's me rambling off on a tangent. But as I say, like, what's the, why are we treating everything as a rational scientific response when they're perfectly good irrational responses? Um, we the like tangents here. Being we don't, don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I am built from tangents. That's all I am. <laughs> like, yeah, like, I'm, I'm just like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I think to yeah. your point like, about the enlightenment was a really good point because actually this idea of like, you know, everything should be rational and like privileging this one point of view, you know, people aren't rational. The unconscious isn't rational. Life isn't rational. Like there's a lot of stuff going on here and, and it's taught people to kind of dismiss or pathologize their own internal experiences and their own experience of their lives in the world and to constantly think that there's something wrong with them or that there's they're crazy or something's wrong with me that I can't do this right or think in this way or I should be like this instead of the way I am and it's really made people like disempowered yeah uh, there's there's amazing interview with Alan Moore uh, with, I think they're just called ARTE, I can't remember what the full group's called, um, where he discusses his magical practice. And he's discussing what magic is. And he's saying, like, once upon a time, like, magic was just everything to do with how we organize knowledge and the mind and, and whatever else. And then when the city came into power, and we had districts, and this is the district for temples, and this is the district for hospitals, and this is the policing district, and this is the residential district, we started splitting down what magic was. So the alchemy became chemistry. Uh, the inner world stuff became psychiatry. The healing aspect like of the wise woman of the woods became uh, medicine. And then what we were left with was the performative aspect, the capes, the long coats, the wands, you know, the rituals. And that became illusionists on stage with theatre and magic lost that K at the end and became just a sideshow attraction. And this all is around that pre around enlightenment period-ish of time where we began to go oh this needs to be demarcated so we can really focus on this which isn't in itself a bad idea but it is in the uh in the wider scope of things because that's why we've ended up with in england i act where cbd is uh, cbt is the answer to everything like because they did the research with science that showed that worry diaries help people which they do but because the data showed that it that it was amazing, they just thought, oh, we'll just throw that at them. Whereas they didn't understand that there might be a theatrical element that is needed, them performing what they need to perform, that there's a medical element with the chemistry of the mind. There's, you know, the social element of you having to pay a landlord outrageous fees just to not freeze to death. Um, and we've forgotten that interrelationship of these things. Um, and I think this extends into art with copyright and intellectual property. I think this extends into uh, how we view the police force. I think this extends into how we view medicine. It just, it, again, it's that fractal thing of if we're gonna demarcate stuff, it affects how we view other stuff. And we need to start reintegrating it back. And I think the only way that we're gonna do that is by not reading ostensibly old white dudes. <laughs> and. <laughs> looking at all of these other cultures which England just squashed for no reason uh, because they seem to have uh, epistemological structures which are just so alien to us that I can't help but hope that somewhere in it all is the answer to how we integrate all of this stuff again. Um, yeah, well, and they lasted yeah. for thousands of years before, like you said, the colonization happened. So, you know, they, everyone was doing pretty well for thousands of years before this. Now we've had like a real crisis period this past couple hundred of years. And it's because of how we framed history. Like I follow, I can't remember what they're called. I'm really bad at remembering people's names. It's really bad. But there's a, a historian on Twitter who was talking, who regularly talks about the Dark Ages and how the Dark Ages weren't some weird period of history where no one developed anything and everything was awful. It's called the Dark Ages because there's very little recorded evidence of what was happening at the time. What was actually happening was, you know, saffron was being like distributed across Europe. There was new relationships between the East and the West. Uh, like it was, it was a flourishing time, but we've written it off as the Dark Ages. And we've said that Rome is, the answer to all problems because they invented democracy which 
is just amazing without any critical analysis at all and everything is great there so we'll just do that um and there's a whole swathe of civilizations and knowledge and just texts and uh folklore uh which may hold the key to what we do next um and how we all help one another um but we're not going to do that if we're still if we're still debating in psychotherapy therapy counseling you know whether police officers are actually nice inside i think if that's still the debate that we're having then we've got a long way to go before we really get into the nuts and bolts of how we benefit culture society individuals the relationship between them blah 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 yeah well that seems like a good place to stop i have i have to wrap up in a couple of minutes because i have someone at the hour um but it was yeah. really nice to talk with you and actually it's funny that you brought up alan moore because when you were saying something much earlier i was going to bring him up as well because i had been at a conference with him uh in north Hampton. i don't know i guess it was maybe five years ago um yeah, and, and he was talking about that kind of thing, this like constant like split, split, split into all these different fields and how he felt we really needed to start kind of bringing the magic back and merging the fields again, emerging the way we think about things instead of having everything be so divided and demarcated in that way. I envy literally everyone because it appears that everyone has met Alan Moore apart from me. <laughs> I worked with a guy when I was doing theatre who had met Alan Moore in Northampton. Uh, there's a guy in my local village who runs the bookshop and he's met Alan Moore. You've met Alan Moore. And even though I know Alan Moore wouldn't want me to put him on a pedestal and squee over him like a fanboy, like that is all I want to do. <laughs> and ev everyone has met him and I really want to meet him. It's not fair. Um, so yeah, I'm envious. I'm very envious. Well, it was lovely to speak with you and you're always welcome back anytime like when your book comes out or if you have anything else coming up just let me know you can just come on and promote it you know thank you yeah um yeah i'm i'm trying to always be writing and creating and everything uh if you go on my twitter i put a link to all of my stuff as a pinned tweet at the top on my gum road um uh, there's a whole other rant I wanted to go into about copyright and intellectual property and how I think that's like stopping creativity, uh, which is why all of my stuff um, is pay what you feel you can put in zero if you want, if you want to just download it. Times are tough enough already without me charging it tons of amounts for PDFs. Um, so it's all copyright free. You can do anything you want with it. You can download it for any price. Just yeah, it's there, enjoy it. And yeah, I hope we can all do something really fucking cool together. <laughs> no, I'm big into that as well. And I love to do cut ups. And um, I've had a couple of people on that talk about remix and this kind of idea that everything is like, you know, everything's already been done. Everything should just be, you know, it's just being hashed and rehashed and put together in different formations. And the whole Burroughs idea of like, you know, all writing is cut up because we're just like rearranging words. So it's like, you know, people should stop being so um, obsessed with this ownership thing. People can get really precious of like, this is my idea. I made this idea happen. And uh, I don't, I don't see how that benefits. I'm just going to go into another rant and you need to go in a bit. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. That's a whole other thing. I'll save that for another time. Um, but yeah, um, short, shorter version. Um, I, I have tried to make my work as accessible as I can so that people can just download it and do whatever they want with. Um, because that that's more important to me, seeing what the ideas do later than uh, just me going, I made this. Um, so yeah, I hope that some people check it out and I hope that uh, when I finally get into counseling, I can bring some of this annoying radicalism <laughs> into helping people. Um, but this has been great. Thank you for letting me just ramble on about anything. It's been great. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a discussion with Nathan Dean. For more, 
follow him at Twitter at Olave C. That's O L L A M H C at Twitter. And check out his writing at Medium at olavecounseling.medium.com. And now the song Metaphysical Mirage from the album Switching from the two CD set Switching Mirrors, available from Highbrow Low Life and Tripart Editions. You can find it at Bandcamp, streaming digitally at highbrowlowlife.bandcamp.com. Enjoy. Physical mirage of the performance, the soundtrack, the mother, this whole mother image. Founded with the metaphysical mirage, effective fusion, the art of within it, assemblage control, constricting thought and creativity, noting that in every civilization, society, and 